you don't want to come in and you want to go back to the visitor centre which is dedicated to Scarborough and there's a film and an exhibition you can do and you can get a cup of tea and cake and toilets you can do and it's down there and the coach is just behind it mm -hmm. right okay Scarborough's over there visitor centre where we come in is over there we're gonna go in there we come out of that door and we just turn right and we go down to the visitor centre and the coach. Remembering to be back at the coach for 22 um, But it's all different dates. Every single generation who's lived here have added bits on. Scale comes from the Norse word meaning skull or Viking drinking hall. And the earliest bits of Scale House is this bit here, the grey end that is gable on with two windows. That is the 16th century hall. It was acquired by Bishop Graham. He owned vast amounts of estate in the 16th century. And he added this wing with the four windows. Later on, that was done in 1620. In 1670, they added two more wings on to turn that into a courtyard. And then in 1792, they added the south wing. Every single family who has lived at Scale House has done something to it. And it's been the Grahams, the Watts, the Scarfs, and the McCrays. It's now owned by Major Malcolm McCray, and he doesn't live here. Um, some of it is occupied as self-catering places and flats and stuff like that. Major Malcolm McCray lives at Bin's Calf, and I will point that out to you when we go past it. I, I totally agree with you all. We didn't have enough of that time there, did we? We should have had, we should have had three hours there. But the only solution is you've all got to come back. Just come back and have a lovely holiday just in Orkney. Send the bill to you. Don't <laughs> 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 come and stay at my house. <laughs> Not all at once. So we're going right. Right. <laughs> So let me tell you about the Vikings. Right. Um, we basically think we have continuity of our population from the people at Scarabray right the way through. The Romans never got this far north, so we don't have any Roman invasion here. And we do have a little bit of Roman stuff that turns up, so we think they were trading. But the Romans really didn't turn up here at all. Yeah. Um, after the Roman, after sort of that, that sort of period of time, we have what's known as the Pictish people in Orkney. Um, I don't know very much about them. And in about 800, about that time, the Norse Vikings start to invade, and then they start to colonise. And we get most of our stories of the Norse Vikings from the Orkney Inga saga, which was written down in Iceland about 1200. But they started to colonise, and by about um, about a thousand years ago, they had really basically settled. And the earldom of Orkney was a very powerful one. And the king of Norway would usually appoint two earls, so that they would squabble amongst themselves and not cause any problem for the king of Norway. And then what happened in 1468? Basically, about that time, Norway and Denmark were. Basically, the two kingdoms were together, and a Danish princess was sent to marry a Scottish king in 1468. But the king of Norway had a bit of a he had a bit of a credit crunch going on. He had a bit of a cash flow problem, and he couldn't raise the dowry for her. He couldn't give some money for when she went and made this big diplomatic wedding. So instead, he pawned the Orkney Islands, and then in 1472, he pawned the Shetland Islands and he said that they were worth 60,000 florins of the realm. And basically, if Denmark and Norway ever pay the money back to the Scottish throne, the Scottish realm, we can go back to Norway. And every so often, people do suggest that it would be a good idea for us to go back to Norway. Um, we have uh, a a lot of connections with Norway even today. Um, we we have a, a, a Norway. Um, uh, it's not an embassy. It's the next one down. Consulate. We have one of those in Kirkwall. Our flag is very similar to the Norwegian flag, and we have something called um, 
the Norwegian cog, which is when a lot of Norwegian people come over in their national costume and they, they sort of like parade through the streets of Kirkwall. And I belong to the Orkney Archaeological Society, I'm on their committee. And last night we hosted uh, a, a joint event between the Orkney Archaeology Society and the Norwegian Society and we hosted an event for them, which is very nice. We have a lot of contacts. Mm. You're going basically right ahead of the first level. Okay. You can see all the fields have been prepared for the seed on the right. That is going to be a grass crop up here. <laughs> and that's the reason why we've got so much Nor um, Norse heritage here, why we're so keen on the Vikings. When we go to the Ring of Brodgar, I'm going to show you some Viking writing. Um, and basically I keep talking about parishes. Now if that was back in the south of England you'd think that was an ecclesiastical or church term, mm. but up here it's not. It's a, a land division devised by the Vikings. Um, they, so they've given us language, they've given us the way we build our houses, they've given us a lot of things. When we go and see St Magnus Cathedral that is very much of a Viking you cathedral. You see an amazing stone circle which is actually you thought I was enthusiastic about Scarabrae. This is my favourite site in the whole of Orkney. You're hardly going to be able to put my enthusiasm. Oh, I'm hardly going to be able to keep it contained. I'm very sorry. <laughs> if I'm too enthusiastic for you, I'm really sorry. But it's lovely. So we're going to go and see the Ring of Brodka. On the left of us, we've got the Harry Lock. Harry is another parish, and I live the other side. <laughs> And the Harry Lock is, I think it's the largest lock in Orkney, and it's a freshwater lock. And out the right hand side window is the Stennis Lock, and the Stennis Lock is a saltwater lock. And Stennis is another parish. Harry, which is actually spelled H A R R A Y, is the only parish in the whole of Orkney that does not have any coast. And they call us the Harry Crabs. <laughs> never known the Ring of Brodga to be an entirely comfortable site. It's, um, it is windy and it's quite exposed there and you might need to take a coat just in case. So we're going to go and see a henge monument that is about 5,000 years old. Henges are circular prehistoric monuments built by the earliest farmers and they consist of an internal ditch with an external bank mm -hmm. and the best well known one is Stonehenge in Wiltshire of course. The Ring of Brodga is part of the World Heritage Site. The whole area has been geophysed. I did wonder. <laughs> I guess the ground here can get a bit boggy at times in the winter, so hence this wooden walk way up to a lane. Just enjoying the natural bird song in the background. God was saying that apparently because they don't have many trees here, birds tend to nest in the heather.
have got hills all the way around them. This is quite common to where these types of sites are placed in the British Isles. This is one of the earliest types of these sites in the whole of the British Isles. Hinges are found in Ireland and throughout England, Wales and Scotland. These are one of the most northerly hinges. And they are only found in Orkney in this part of mainland. And we are on a thin strip of land between a freshwater lock and a saltwater lock. We don't know if they would have been locks 5,000 years ago, they could have just been marshy ground. But they would have certainly have been wet and damp and this would have been dry land. And we've got a hedge. I want you to notice about how it is aligned with the twin hills of Hoy there and the sun that sets between them at midwinter solstice. This is the third largest stone circle in the British Isles. It's much bigger than Stonehenge and it's much older. It dates to about 4,500 years ago or about 2,500 BC, but we don't know. There have not actually been very many excavations here. There have been some trial excavations through the ditch and they were trying to do some dating of it, uh, but it refused to give up its secrets. As I said, a henge is a circular monument. This is about 100, uh, 100 metres in diameter. It's about 300 foot. And originally, the ditch would have been about four or five metres deep. And it would have been dug into solid bedrock. It has silted up. These early people, they only had stone tools and possibly antlers to dig with. And they were digging into solid bedrock. If you'd come here about 4,000 years ago, you would not have been so astounded by the wonderful stones as the ditch they dug. That would have been what you'd want to Wow, that must have taken some time. Right, hot circles. <coughs> um, they've geophysed it and there is no evidence of houses inside. But there is evidence of houses up at Wasbister up here. And just down here is the very famous Ness of Rodger excavation, where of course we've got a lot of houses. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, they are. Have you seen the swans out on the lock of Harry to the left? No. Oh, they were just approaching where the right. Nessa so Rodgers Here is the Nessa Rodgers just coming up on your right hand side. Give it up to see. That is the world famous excavation. It's been it go excavations going on every year for about 10 years. It's It's been on oh, TV yeah. with the Neil Oliver oh, programs. Oh, yes. yeah. And it is absolutely fascinating. If you want to know more about it, please join Orkney Archaeology Society. Well, we've just been gifted Lock View, which is the house on the right, by a wealthy American benefactor, which is very kind of him. And we're just crossing over a small bridge, and on both the left and the right hand side, there is a swan nesting. Ooh, very near to us on the left, yeah, and then one a bit further out on the right. Running out of video, but. Uh... And we're just about to pass on the right hand side a very large standing stone, a monolith which is called the Watchstone. I don't know why it's called that, but it's called the Watchstone. And then just coming up on our left are the Standing Stones of Stennis. Oh. These are older than Brodger by about 500 years, Ooh. and the stones are taller. And please, everyone, I've got to cut you down to five minutes here. Stay I'm really here. sorry. Ooh, it's not so here. far to walk. This is a class one henge. There's only one entrance. And it's lovely. And I'll, if you're very good and you behave, I'll show you where the farmer put his explosives to blow the stone up. Do you know what that is? Well, David Finn got his name on a lot of title deeds in Finstown, and he gave his name to the village. It now is very roughly between the two main centres of population, which is Stromness and Kirkwall. And it's basically, it's, it's possibly the third largest settlement on 
there's some debate about which the third largest settlement is, but I think there must be about 700 people living in Finstown. Yeah. Um, and it's basically a lot of the people from here commute to, and work either in Stromness or Kirkwall. And you'll see on your right, you'll see a lot of the new housing that's been built, which will have been built either by Orkney Islands Council or Orkney Housing mm. Association. And it's mm. all—it's what we call social housing, so it's housing for a fair rent. And it's all new and it's often built very environmentally friendly. And it's all it's often got heat pumps installed, which is a very cheap way of eat, heating your house. We so have no main gas in all It's almost gone. So no main gas, so there. we have to use oil no or we have to use electricity. And electricity is very expensive. Um, I've, I've installed what's called an air source heat pump, which basically works like a refrigerator in reverse. And there's all sorts of government grants to put them in. And it means for every one um, kilowatt of electricity I use to heat my house, the machine converts that into about three kilowatts of electricity by some sort of weird magic that I'm sure some of you will happily explain to me. Looking out to your left is the Bay of Firth. Now, before we became a submerged landscape where we only live on the tops of hills, that was a lovely fertile coastal plain. There's been a lot of underwater archaeology investigations there and they found all sorts of things in that bay. And you used to be able to walk across to the two islands that you can see on your left. The first is called the Holm of Grimbuster and the one behind it which you can't see is called Damsey. You can still walk across to the Holm of Grimbuster. The guy doesn't live there all year round but you can see there's a causeway there. That's actually well exposed at the moment. But most of the time you'll go past that and that causeway will be underwater and you can just see the tips of that gate sticking out and people are really confused as to what it might be. That's a gate in the middle of nowhere, but it's just to, to stop the cows getting off. It keeps a herd of cows on there. And then the island just beyond it is called Damse, which means twin islands. So we think that they were originally, both of them were called Damse. And they've all got those endings say, which tells you that they're a Viking word. Yeah, it's five, it's, was it five o'clock or four o'clock? Five o'clock. Five o'clock. Yeah, and look, you'd think it was about two o'clock in the afternoon, mm. wouldn't you? Think about light levels. Mm. It's amazing. I've got one of those modern watches that are very artistic and trendy and haven't actually got numbers written on them, so I have to guess where the big hand and the little hand is. And with somebody with as little common sense and as dippy as me, you can see that might have been a bad purchase. Bye.